like to give thanks to the Propeller Club for having this event. It's a great uh, event, always gives me a chance to tell you a little bit about what we've accomplished, but more importantly about what we seek to do in the next few years, which will be an exciting time for us together. <clears throat> I want to uh, take a second to recognize a few people that I think deserve recognition. Um, first of all, our board, um, who all, all but one are here today, and our chairman, Bill Stern, is not here today. It's the Jewish holidays. Uh, but Dave Posick, Pat McKinney, uh, Pam Lackey, Coach Willie Jeffries, uh, Whit Smith, Mike Sisk is here, Kirk Grindstaff is here. I saw somewhere, I, I don't think Rick Stanley is here today. No. Sorry? Not, not yet. So anyway, so they do a great job in leading the port and giving us guidance, and we're very proud to have them here today. I uh, also want to give recognition to the South Carolina legislature, because as you may or may not know, we're the only state in the country that has the entire state share of our harbor deepening project in a bank account. That was put aside in 2012, very foresightful. It's a game changer as far as our port and our deepening project is concerned. So there, there are several legislators here. I'm looking at Chairman Leatherman, Senator Grooms, Jenny Horn, Paul Campbell is here. I saw Chip Campson in the corner. There are others here as well. I don't mean to leave anyone out. But that's a game changer for us. And, and having the state as a partner is extremely meaningful for us, and we're very grateful. Also, like to give thanks to our congressional delegation, Congressman Sanford, Congressman Mulvaney. Without their leadership in Congress, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. It's a jump ball to get this done, and they've done a great job. So we're very grateful for that, very grateful for them being here. Uh, have an opportunity to especially recognize some people that are very close to me uh, from my past. Um, I started my career in Houston. Uh, I was way too young running a container yard at 24 years old at City Dock 8. But I had the privilege at that time of meeting a gentleman who's now the Executive Vice President Emeritus of the International Longshoremen's Association. And he's here today. It's Benny Holland. I'm very grateful for his presence. Um, Equally, I'm very proud of Alan Robb, who's the president of the South Atlantic and Gulf District of the ILA. He's here today. Stand up, Alan. You're the tallest guy in the shipping business, I think, actually. But he just was recently elected to that position. Very glad to have you here. Dave Adam of the USMX, who represents the ocean carriers, is a good partner of ours as well. And then finally, and this is probably unscripted, but uh, it's a lady here that was very close to my father in Savannah that supported him for many years. I didn't know she'd be here. I'm very Grateful for that. She's a close friend of my family, but Roberta Beasley from Savannah, if she would stand up. So anyway, a lot of important people here today, and thank everybody for coming. One other thing, if you will indulge me, I'm going off script just a little bit, but I invited Dr. David Cole, who's the president of the Medical University of South Carolina. Please stand up. Dr. Rita Ryan, who runs the MUSC Children's Hospital, and Mark Swetman, who works for MUSC. I'm sure you all know this, but the Children's Hospital, we're building a $350 million children's hospital in this town. And there was a $25 million gift from Sean Jenkins to, to kickstart that effort, but it's a wonderful philanthropic cause. Many of you here have no doubt had people that were treated in the Children's Hospital with the great care that you get there. So I'm very proud of our collaboration together, David and Rita and, and Mark, and we welcome you here today. You, it's a big maritime community, and I hope they'll keep you in mind in there philanthropic efforts, so thank you. So I'll tell you a little bit about the port. Uh, we're a $200 million business. We're a top 10 container port in the U.S. That's critical because I think if you're not a top 10 container port, you will not stay in the container game in the future. Uh, the people of South Carolina are shareholders. We have a real fiduciary responsibility to the people of South Carolina. It's an economic driver and strategic asset. We offer the best product in the container port industry at the lowest cost. That's important. Uh, we have a very skilled and talented workforce. I don't think we talk about that enough. We talk a lot about assets, about investing. We don't talk about the quality of the people in this industry and in, in this town. There's a great maritime heritage in this town. Not only the people who work for me in the port, the extended maritime community, the ILA, the other logistics companies, they do a phenomenal job. And we're really focused on growing our container business about two times the U.S. port average. And I'll talk a little bit about that as, as we go through this talk. 
We're really in three primary segments. Containers are about 80% of our business. Break bulk about 16% and, and crews about 4 or 5%. So, so very focused on, on three endeavors. We had a very good year in fiscal 2015. Our year is July through June, you know that. We're almost at 2 million TU, that's up 14.5% year on year. We had 30 million in operating earnings, that translates into 65 million in operating cash flow. 900,000 break bulk tons, 190,000 cruise passengers, uh, almost 250,000 containers handled by rail, that's 22% of our volume moves by intermodal container rail. And longshore man hours pretty close to record levels. So, Johnny, we're getting back in the, in the right direction, okay? And then in the last five years, fiscal 10 through fiscal 15, we've had a really important turnaround in the port, and you can see it in these numbers. So our revenue has gone from 112 million to 196 million. Pier container growth from 741,000 to almost 1.1 million. That's 48%. That's about twice the U.S. port average in the last five years. So we've been growing well above the market. Again, operating earnings from $8 million to about $30 million. Uh, return on capital from 1% to 3%. That's still not good enough. It's something we have to further improve, and we've got a plan to do that. And then again, container rail from 12% of our, our, inter our container volume to 22%. So a lot of important things that mark a turnaround in our port. We built an inland port in Greer, South Carolina, uh, in the, opened in November of 2013. It's a $50 million investment. A few people raised their eyebrows when we said we're going to invest $50 million in an inland port. I think it's one of the best things that we ever did. We had 58,000 lifts last year in the second year of operation. We're on track for almost 100,000 lifts this year. We had 7,500 lifts alone in the month of July. We have our first retail distribution center going into that area by Dollar Tree, which will be in Calpin, South Carolina. And believe it or not, my people are already telling me we need to expand the inland port in 2017. So that's a luxury problem, having to spend money to expand something that really works. And it's our thesis that more such facilities are needed. So we're really going to look with the railroads, the two class one railroads in the east, to see if there are more places that we can intelligently locate an inland port. So. Uh, a great diversification of our logistics footprint. Manufacturing is critical to port growth. You heard Dr. Von Nessen talk about that a little bit. We see that in our numbers every day. But if you look at the five companies here, and I'm going to say a word about Volvo in a second, but if you look at the five companies excluding Volvo, they alone are responsible for 10% of our port volume. Five companies, 10% of our port volume. Importers bring it, I mean, Manufacturing companies bring in cargo, they, they take out cargo as well. So very important to grow manufacturing. The state's on a roll in doing that. It's very critical that we continue to do that. There are two gentlemen from Volvo here today, Lars Kraft and Dieter DeHorn. You are all aware of the very significant decision by Volvo Cars to build a manufacturing plant in Berkeley County. Uh, will be a game changer for our port in terms of volume. I'd like to ask Lars and Dieter to, to stand up and be recognized. Maybe you give them a hand. So, <laughs> so this is one sort of one last look in the rearview mirror because after now I don't want to talk about fiscal 15 anymore. That's in the past. We need to talk about the future. But I would say that we are a strong, visible global brand in the port. We're positioned for growth twice the market because we're in a good port region. We've taken bold steps to make our intermodal rail competitive. We've simplified our contracts. We're on the road for operating earnings improvement. And I would say that we have a strong value proposition. And really, our goal is quite simply to be the most preferred port for a shipping line in the United States and for a customer to use. And I think that's the, that's the, the litmus test for our success. So, Last we'll talk about fiscal 15, now we'll talk about the future. So the next five years will be the most decisive five years in the history of our port. We have several things to do. We have to make sure we retain and enhance our competitiveness. We have to prepare for the, the introduction of more big ships. We already have 11 big ship services a week in our port. That will be the future of our port. We're deepening our harbor, um, and we'll talk a bit about that in a second. Uh, we have to build more infrastructure as the port. 
We also need private sector companies to build port-related infrastructure. Those go hand in hand in terms of handling more cargo. We've got to improve our earnings because we've got to invest a lot of money. We have simply to earn or borrow money or, or, or we cannot invest. Uh, we have to be able to borrow, as I said. We've got to continue to find creative ways to grow intermodally. Certainly intermodal rail is critical. Keeping our truckers successful is critical. We've got to expand our cargo base. Uh, we've got to focus on our human capital. This is a great industry. You saw the average wage driven by this industry is significantly above the state average. So why not grow this industry? It's good for the state if we can do that. And then fully and finally, one day we need to build a new terminal in Jasper County, basically, on the Savannah River. So it's a, a forward-looking project, but it's something that we have to work on today. So the next five years will determine our future together. The good news fundamentally is the southeast is the best place to be in the U.S. port market. And the reason is pretty simple. We have pop population that's growing here. There are very few companies that are moving from the south back to the north. The general trend is for people to come south. We have manufacturing growth in the southeast and many more projects to come. There's a tremendous amount of foreign direct investment still to be done in, in this region. We are very export focused. Maybe that's taking a bit of a pause right now because of China but certainly that will be the dominant trend over the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, we've got to invest in our terminals. We've got good terminals today. We've got a, a beautiful facility in Wando. We're going to build a new facility in the Navy base, and, and we have to keep that going. We have ample land to build port-related infrastructure. Again, the private sector needs to do that. The Panama Canal is being expanded. If you're coming to the trade conference, you'll hear about that tomorrow. We have the deputy administrator to tell you about that. It's going to happen next year and the Bayonne Bridge in New Jersey. And people look at me and say, Jim, why do you want to tell us about the Bayonne Bridge in New Jersey? But if you heard me talk before, it's very simple. If the Bayonne Bridge in New Jersey doesn't get up to 215 feet, it's almost impossible to bring big ships to the east coast of the United States because the ships have to go to New York. Uh, one of the things in the southeast that's different than other ports in big cities, our ports are not in big cities. So we're not L.A. Long Beach, we're not Shanghai, we're not New York. We don't have population clusters of 40 or 50 million people. So we serve an entire region um, together, and that really means that things have to work intermodally and, and connectivity-wise. So global logistics is a cost-focused game. And as we keep our costs competitive and as, as we're able to deliver a good product, I think we can, we can prosper in this region. Um, being a top 10 port is critical to invest. We're the number nine port in the U.S. today. Uh, that's actually as a 2014 calendar year figure. Uh, we're closer to two million based on the fiscal year. If, I think it's very unlikely that a port not in this list today is going to jump into the top 10. It's a big stakes game. There's a lot to be invested. I just read the port in Norfolk was talking about having to invest $2 billion. Port of Long Beach and L.A. are investing over $5 billion. Staying in this container game is a big stakes game, so you've got to have critical mass to do so, and we're in that hunt today. This is a big ship industry. If, 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 if you've heard anything that we've said over the last five or six years since I've been here, we need to prepare to handle big ships. It is a fact that 60% of the global container fleet capacity by the end of 2017 so shortly after the Panama Canal is widened, 60% uh, will be 7,500 TU or larger in, in ships. Those are huge ships. I mean, I can think back to my days in liner shipping as late as 1997. I would have told you we would have never built a ship bigger than 5,000 TUs. So we're, talk we're seeing ships up to 20,000 TUs today. 90% of all the vessels on order, the number of vessels, not the capacity, are greater than 7,500 TUs. Uh, certainly, we think that 14,000 TU ships will come to the East Coast very soon. They almost have to if you look at the deployment of ships. And the one thing for certain is that these big ships require deep and wide harbors for reliable access. And I firmly believe that shipping lines, if they have to make appointments to go through canals and stay on schedule, will not wait to go into ports. They're going to have to have reliable access to ports to, to be successful. So the one thing that we can say with certainty to our clients, big ships can get in and out of Charleston and they can get in and out fast. So that's a real advantage for us. 
It's a picture of an 8,750 TU ship. That's the type of ship that calls our port today. It is in itself a massive ship. It's about 18 containers wide. And width is one of the preeminent things of these big ships today, in addition to depth. Coming soon is this is an MSC Daniela class vessel, 13,800 TU. We believe this type of vessel will be on the east coast of the United States within the next two or three years. And for that reason, we have to invest a lot to be ready. We, have the deep, we will have the deepest harbor on the U.S. East Coast by 2020, and that's a bold claim, uh, and we think it's doable. I'm very proud to have uh, as our guest here today Brigadier General David Turner of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lozado, who's the, the fourth lieutenant colonel in my time here in the port, uh, and Lisa Matheny and Brian Williams, and they have uh, been integrally involved in our deepening project. I won't steal their thunder. I will tell you, I think we're going to get our chief's report today. That's, that's all I'll tell you. I'm pretty sure that that might happen, but we'll see at 4 o'clock, right? So I don't want, to, uh, don't want to get in your way on that. But this is an incredible accomplishment. This is a feasibility study that has been done absolutely on schedule in four years' time, uh, in $7 million less cost than originally projected. So it was $20 million original cost down to $13 million. The total project, $510 million. It's quite reasonable in the context of this to get the deepest harbor on the East Coast. It's quite reasonable. Again, I can't say it enough. Were it not for our South, the South Carolina legislature and the decisive step taken in 2012 to put $300 million in a bank account, we wouldn't be talking about this today. It was absolutely critical. It's now worth $307 million, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, because it's earned some interest along the way. And we need to spend all of that on our harbor deepening. And what it does, it allows us to handle 8,000 TU ships with 48 foot of draft without tidal restrictions. So again, it's not good to have tidal restrictions if you've got to make Panama Canal appointments and things of that nature. So we're looking for as unconstrained a harbor as we can have, a harbor that you see as an ocean harbor that you can pass two ships really without restrictions. So it's a game changer for our port. One of our biggest challenges, we have to invest $1 billion by 2020 to, to be in the top 10 port league. Uh, we've got to build a new terminal at the Navy base. That's what a new terminal looks like before it's built in the top, uh, reclaiming 65 acres for the, from the water. We've got to strengthen the Wando Wharf because when we built the Wando terminal, we never thought we'd see ships of this size. Uh, with this type of outreach requirement. We're, we're buying taller container cranes. Our current cranes are 115 feet high. We're buying 155 foot high cranes to handle the bigger ships and other projects. So it's a big investment number that we've got to achieve. And it's frankly one of the biggest challenges we have in the port is to earn the money, be able to borrow the money, value engineer the projects we have so that we can meet this investment requirement. We are very, very fortunate, again, to have the state of South Carolina as a committed partner. I think one of the best models you can have is a state port model. Uh, if you look at states like Florida where there are city ports, you have 15 ports competing for scarce resources. That's a very bad model. So we're in a good situation. Again, the state's supporting us on the harbor deepening, supporting us on the port access road to the Navy base terminal, and building through Jeff McWhorter and his team, the Palmetto Railways, an intermodal container transfer facility in North Charleston. So a lot has to come together all at once. The state is putting another $700 million into our port, basically, when you consider those three projects. So it's a huge bet on the future of the port, the region, and the southeast. So it's an ambitious plan. It's a requirement. How do we pay for it? So it's very simple. I said it already. We've got to value engineer the projects. We've got to make sure that we build them as efficiently as we can. That means we're not building Rolls Royces, we're building Impalas, we're doing the best we can to, to value engineer our projects. We have to earn the money or we have to be able to borrow it. So it's critical that our numbers are good, that our projections are creditable in terms of volume, in terms of earnings, because the rating agencies view us no differently than they view a private sector company. If we're not creditable, it's gonna be very hard for us to borrow the type of money that we need. We've done a good job in this up to now and it's something that we will continue doing. Just a bit of math of terminal investments, it's, it make it tangible for you. I told you in the left-hand column we earned in 2015 $30 million. 
we have a billion dollar asset base. I went to Tennessee, I can still do math, actually, that's 3% that's return on capital. Um, actually, the requirement in the public sector should be about a 6% return on capital. So we needed to earn about $60 million in 2015. And then we're going to double our asset base by 2020. You, you just heard me tell you that. So if you earn a 6% return on capital, you need to earn $120 million. So it's not hard to see that we have to improve our earnings to be successful. Maybe interesting for you if you're one of the top five private terminal companies such as APM Terminals or DP World, they would require greater than a 12% return on capital. So they, they would not do what we're doing for a 6% return on capital. They would require much more. So, so we've got our work cut out for us to achieve this. I think and I'm sure that we can do it. So, so what are the actions required to do this? Well, number one, we've got to continue growing above the market. Uh, I've said pretty publicly we should be able to grow twice the U.S. port market. We've got to have an improved revenue model. We've got to make sure that, that our value proposition is really being the best working port in the country aligns with our revenue model. We've got to have a very cost-based approach to our business. We're not in, we're in a cost game. Global logistics is a cost game. So we've got to make sure we're as efficient as we can, as productive as we can be, and continue to do that. We've got to prioritize our capital expenditures. We can't spend on everything. We've got to make sure that we make choices, spend it in the right places where we can earn a proper return. And, and then the last thing is that we've got to streamline our organization. We've got to enhance our effectiveness. I said it pretty publicly. I want to enhance the culture in our port. Um, and I think it's something that we need to do to manage our business better, and we will do that. Intermodal infrastructure is key. If you look at how freight moves, if you're in this industry, most of you realize that freight moves on the cheapest inland cost, all things equal. Um, can be differences in shipping services. If we have an Australia service another port doesn't have, we may get some incremental cargo. But freight typically moves on the most competitive inland costs. So truck productivity is key to truck, is key to truck capacity. And I've, I've been very public about it. We'll continue to be very public about it. We're a friend of the truckers. We want to make sure that the truckers can make a living. It's a very entrepreneurial business. Most truckers own and operate their trucks. They take a percentage of revenue. What can the port do about that? We've got to make sure we have the right number of gate hours, so we've extended our gate hours. We've got to have good turn times. Maximum one hour portal to, from the whole scheme of things, not just measured from the gate, but measured from the queue and everything. We started a rapid rail program whereby we're draining literally 250,000 containers a year to and from the railroad. When I started here, we were not seen as a very rail capable port. People see us as a very rail capable port today. We've got to do better things to enhance our process. I'm not a big fan of appointment systems. So the latest and greatest is everybody should have an appointment system in a port. I'm not sure how you manage that, but what I do think is that we can get a lot of pre-notification, particularly on inbound loads and on empty pickups, so we can have boxes ready, potentially chopped out of the stack when the truckers show up to pick them up. Certainly our road infrastructure's gotta be improved in this state to support the growth of intermodalism and, and the general growth of the state. Our legislature's very much on top of that and I'm very optimistic that they will deal with that. And, and most importantly and finally, we've got to have two engaged Class 1 railroads. And we work very strategically with the Norfolk Southern. We work very strategically with the CSX on multiple levels, containers, brake bulk, whatever way freight moves. Railroads are the winners in terms of intermodal efficiency, and we have to work closely with them to enhance our competitiveness. They have a great impact on our future. So expanding our cargo base is essential. So how do you do that? We've got to win our home market. We've got to make sure the freight that should move over this market has services, over this port has services that are needed to, to, to move their cargo. We've got to win more discretionary business. There, you may or may not know, there are about 200,000 incremental containers of plastics that will move from a year from 2017 to 2020 and beyond because of the low price of natural gas and the growth of manufacturing capability in, in the Gulf area. Not all of that's going to get on ships in the Gulf. So we need to be ready with private sector investment to have facilities to transload that cargo. Uh, again, private investment in port related infrastructure. More inland port facilities, we're committed to find more locations for that. We think it's a great model. 
um, cargo from ports that are not able to work big ships. There are some ports that are not going to be able to invest this type of money that we're talking about. We need to grab a share of that cargo here. And last and certainly not least, we need to win more major economic development projects. There is no substitute for a new Volvo cars or a new project like that in terms of the future of a port like ours. So growing our cargo base and investing, really the two major challenges for the future in our port. We've got to renew our human capital. Again, we don't, I don't think we talk about it enough. We have great people. Um, I'm very proud of the people that work for the South Carolina Ports Authority. They're very talented, they're very committed, but we have to recognize that transportation is a bit of an aging workforce. It's hard to get young people into this industry for whatever reason, so we've got to really focus and organize ourselves to do that. So we need to modernize our approaches to attract talent, to keep talent, to evaluate talent. We have to understand millennials. Now everybody talks, I've got a couple of millennials. You probably have millennials. They're supposedly not understandable. They're very different creatures, right? Well, any of you my age that think that's the case, just go back and Netflix and put on the movie Woodstock <laughs> and see how well your parents understood you. <laughs> so, so don't talk too badly about the millennials. They're not that, uh, they're not that bad after all. They've got a lot of talent. But we've got to al align our human resources needs with education. Not everybody needs a four-year liberal arts degree. You can have a two-year technical degree. You can do things that, that train people for jobs. They do a much better job of that in Europe than we do here. Uh, and we need to emulate some of that. So I think leadership from our side and attracting human capital, all of your companies need to go to a college and mentor a student and hire an and have an internship and interest people in the industry. If you want people to get in this industry, you got to give them some hope that there's a future. You've got to show it to them. So I'm, I'm issuing a challenge to you to do that. The Jasper Ocean Terminal, um, a big project. So think of this, a 1,500-acre terminal, bigger than any single terminal anywhere in the United States, costing $5 billion, handling some of the biggest ships in the world, requiring a deeper harbor than is in Savannah today. It's going to require a harbor that's as deep or deeper than what we're getting here with basically no infrastructure into the facility within 10 miles of, of where that facility is going to be. It's a big project. Uh, and believe it or not, and it's in, it, while we may need it in 2030, we have to start working on it today. So it takes that long to build a terminal. So we're going to start permitting that terminal uh, later this year once we have our chief's report. So exciting project, very challenging, and it will be needed to keep the southeast as a growing region. Without port capacity to move manufactured goods in the global sourcing, global manufacturing world, a region cannot be successful. So in summary, the next five years bring with them a lot of great opportunity for us if we do our job well. Let's just summarize that. We've got to grow well above the market. I don't know what the economy is going to do. I'm certainly not smart enough to know what China's doing right now. Um, but, but all I know is that we should grow well above the market. If the port, port market grows 3%, we need to grow 6%, or about twice the market. That's critical for us. We've got to strengthen our value proposition to clients. We've got to be a better port than we are today. It's not good enough to rest on your laurels. So if, we do, if we're doing well today, we need to do better. We need to be the preferred port for shipping lines and BCO customers to use. We've got to have earnings that justify the required investment. It's inextricably linked. There's no shortcut there, and it's a major job for us to focus on that. We've got to have infrastructure that's a catalyst for economic development. Economic development projects follow infrastructure, not just the ports investment, but again, private sector companies who are willing to take some entrepreneurial risk to grow in this industry. We, we need that type of partnership. As you saw, it's a lucrative industry in which to work. We don't talk about that enough. We've got to get young people into this industry. We've got to make it an attractive place to work. And we've also got to recognize that we coexist with a beautiful community. We are in the number one city in the United States for people to visit. We also want to be a major port. Those two things have to coexist. They can coexist. They have always coexisted, and they will coexist in the future, but we've got to be mindful of that. So 
keep our eyes on the prize. By 2020, three things have to happen that are critical to our future. Again, realize and, and have a 52-foot harbor constructed, at least part of that harbor. Navy Base Terminal Phase 1 needs to be in existence by that time. Dual-served intermodal container transfer facility in North Charleston in, in operation in that time. So three things have to come together all at once to solidify our future. So the, I guess the punchline for all of us, I mean, here today is the leadership of the maritime community here in Charleston. So what I would say to you, if we're going to realize these things, it's not just about the port. The commitment of the entire maritime community is important in this. So how, how do you do that? What do we need to do? We need broad creative thinking. We need aggressive action. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing is not for the faint of heart. It's going to take big commitments. It's going to take entrepreneurial risk. Anyone looking for a sure thing? There are no sure things in this global logistics business. There, there simply aren't. It takes intelligent risk to be successful. Great leadership. Not just managing, but leadership. You know, I had a former boss in my Hapag Lloyd time. I know Peter Bradle uh, will remember Klaus Allstadt. And he said, Jim, do the, the victories go to the bold. The victories go to the bold. It's the people that take decisive steps are the ones that win in, in this type of business. And then finally, uh, collaboration, cooperation, working together, maybe sacrificing our own interests a little bit for the greater good of our community here. These are important things for the future. So we can do all these things. We've got great leadership. We've got great raw material here, but we've got to make it happen. So finally, uh, we're committed to the future. It's going to be an exciting five years. We're back on a good footing today. Uh, and we coined this term keeping freight moving because many ports, quite frankly, in the last year didn't keep freight moving. And I say to most of our customers that use the port, if you have to talk too much about the port, that's a bad thing. The port should just work seamlessly. You shouldn't have to talk about us. We should do our job. So we're committed to do our job. I'm very proud to be the leader of this port. It's been a lot of fun in the last six years. Uh, I hope my football team gets better. I know you do too. Uh, and I think our best days are ahead of us. So I'll thank you all for coming today. Thank you very much. <laughs>